Of course, I don't pretend to be aesthetic and all that, said Hayling. But I must say that all this folk song and dance business does strike me as pretty complete rot. I dare say there may be some arguments in favour of it for exercise and that, but I'm dashed if I can see why a chap needs to leap about in fancy braces because he wants to train down his fat. He lit a cigarette disdainfully. Well, said Mortlake in his quiet, pleasant voice, <laughs> yeah, and some of the revivals are a bit artificial, I expect, yes. But no, it, it's, not, it's not just a, a question of exercise, not in this case anyway. No, but people who know say that it's the remains of a religious cult, you know, sacrificial rites and that, and, and there are certainly some, some odd things done in out-of-the-way places. How do you mean? asked Hayling. <laughs> you, you can't really think that there's any kind of heathen cult still practice in this country, can you? Well, I mean, there's not much left now, perhaps, said Mortlake. More in Wales, I believe, and, and France than here, but yes. No, I, I reckon there are a few places where people have never quite lost the cult, so to say. Places where they still pour, perform their own right occasionally. You, you said you, you're going to a village called Randalls for the weekend, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Little place in the Cotswolds somewhere. Boney recommended it. Yeah, well, if you get the chance, take a look at the records in the Guild Hall there. See, see if you can find any reference to the old customs. Randall, as you see, is supposed to be one of these places where there's a genuine survival. Like they have a game, I think, or, or a dance or something. Anyway, it's called Randall's Round. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know if there, there are any written records. I mean, not if you don't want to, of course, just if you're at a loose end. <laughs> All right, then, I will, said Hayling. And there the talk ended. Now... It's not the usual thing for an Oxford undergraduate to take a long weekend off in the middle of Michaelmas term, but Hayling, from whom his tutor, old Boney, expected great things, had been reading too hard. The weather that autumn was unusually close and clammy, even for Oxford, and he was getting into such a state of nerves that he was only too willing when Boney suggested that he take a chance of getting away for the weekend. The weather, as he cycled out along the Woodstock Road, was uncomfortably moist and warm. But as the miles slipped by and the ground rose, Hayley became aware of a softness in the air and the quiet of the low rolling clouds. Already he felt much calmer and more at ease. Gradually the lift of the ground became more definite and the character of the country changed. It became more open, bleaker. It, it, it took on something of the, the quality of moorland, and the, the littered, little scattered stone houses began to give off that air of being one with the earth that is the, the right of moorland houses. Randall's was, as Boney had told him, a small place, although it had once boasted a market, round a, a little square that was all grown over with grass now, where flocks of shaggy Cotswold sheep had once stood to be sold, were grouped houses, mostly of the, the 17th and 18th century, made of that beautiful, mellow Cotswold stone. Haley noticed um, among these one building of exceptional beauty, earlier in date than the others, long and low, with a, a deep square porch and mullioned windows. Ah, that'll be the Guild Hall that Mortlake mentioned, I suppose he said to himself as he made his way to the Flaming Hand Inn, where his precious town records are kept. <laughs> Queer how that sort of rot gets hold of perfectly sensible men. Well, Hayling received a, a hearty welcome at the Flaming Hand. Visitors were not frequent at that time of year. Randall's is far from the good hunting country, and even a chance weekender was something of an event. He was given an exceptionally pleasant pair of rooms on the ground floor. The, the front one looked out onto the old square and was furnished as a sitting room. The other, the bedroom, gave onto the inn yard, a, a pleasant cobbled place, surrounded by moss-grown wall and barns with lichen roofs. Hayling began to feel quite cheerful and vigorous as he lit his pipe and prepared to spend a lazy evening. As he was settling down in his chair with a novel, he was mildly surprised to hear children's voices chanting outside. He reflected that Guy Fawkes Day was not due yet, and that in any case the tune that they were singing was not the formless huddle usually produced on that occasion. Oh, the, this was a real melody, rather odd and plaintive, 
and, and ending with an abrupt drop that pleased his ear. I mean, little as he knew of folklore and much as he despised it, Haley could not but recognise that this was a genuine old heir and a very attractive one at that. And, and the children didn't appear to be begging, but when their song finished, they, they simply went away. But Haling was surprised again when some minutes later he heard the same air strike up, playing this time on a flute or a flageolet, and then the sound of many feet in the market square. It was evident that the whole population of Randalls had turned out for some occasion. Mildly interested, he, he rose and lounged across to the bay window of his room. And yeah, gosh, the, the tiny square was thronged with villagers all gazing at an empty space left in the centre. At one end of this space stood a man playing on a, a long and curiously sweet-sounding pipe, the same haunting, plaintive melody again and again. In the very centre stood a pole. It was like a maypole, but instead of garlands and ribbons, this had flung over it the shaggy hide of some creature, an ox perhaps. Hayling could just see the blunt, heavy head with its short, thick horns. And then, without a word or a signal, men came out from among the watchers and began a curious dance. Now, Hayling had witnessed folk dancing before in Oxford, but this struck him as being graver, a, a more barbaric affair than the, the performances that he'd seen before. I mean, there was something solemn about this. As he watched, the, the dancers began a figure that he faintly recognised. They, they, they took hands in a ring, facing outwards, and then, with their hands lifted, they began to move slowly round, counterclockwise. A memory stirred within Hailing, and, and two things came drifting into his mind. One was the sound of Mortlake's voice as the two of them had stood watching a performance of the Hunheddington Mummers. That's the black ring, Mortlake had told him. It's supposed to be symbolic of death, a, a survival of a time when a dead victim lay in the middle and the, the dancers turned away from him. The other memory was dimmer and he couldn't remember its source, but he recalled the belief that to move in a counter circle was considered unlucky. I mean, it might have been a Scot who told him that because he, he remembered the word widdershins. But you see, these faint stirrings of memory were snapped off by a sudden movement in the dance going on outside. Two new figures now advanced. One was a man whose head was covered by a mask made in the rough likeness of a bull. The other was shrouded from head to foot in a white sheet so that even the sex was indistinguishable. Without a sound, that these two came into the space in the centre of the dance. The bull-headed man placed the second figure with its back to the pole where hung the hide. And the dancers now began to move more and more slowly. Evidently, some crisis of the performance was coming. And with a sudden movement, the bull-headed man jerked the pole so that the shaggy hide fell outspread onto the shrouded figure standing before it. It gave a horrid impression, as if the creature hanging limp on the pole had suddenly come to life and with one swift, terrible movement had engulfed and devoured the helpless victim standing passively before it. Hailing felt quite shocked, startled as if he ought to do something. They even threw the window open as though to spring out and stop the horrid rite. But then he drew back, laughing at his folly. The dancer had come to an end. The bull-headed man lifted the hide from the shrouded figure and threw it carelessly over his shoulder. The flute player stopped his melody and the, the crowd began to melt away. <laughs> what a queer performance, said Hailing to himself. I, mean, I see what old Mortlake means now. It really it does. It looks like a survival of some sort. Where's that book of his? He rummaged in his rucksack and produced a book that Mortlake had lent him. It was one volume of a, a famous work on folklore. Now, there were many accounts in this of village games and feasts, all traced in sober and scholarly fashion to some primitive barbaric rite. Now, though there was nothing fantastic or strained in these accounts, Hailing was pleased to see, nothing of the, the romantic type that he'd scornfully dubbed aesthetic. 
No, that they were as careful and well authenticated as the facts in the scientific treatise. He was particularly interested to see how often mention was made of animal masks or the hides or tails of animals being worn by performers in these odd revels. Randall's was mentioned and the dance described, rather scantily hailing thought, until reading on he found that the author acknowledged that he'd not actually witnessed it himself, but was indebted to a friend for the account. And then Hailing found something that really caught his attention. The origin of this dance, the book said, is almost certainly sacrificial. Near Randall's is one of those banks or mounds surrounded by a thicket which the villagers refuse to approach. Such mounds are not uncommon in the Cotswolds, although few seem to be regarded with quite as much awe as Randall's bank which the country people still avoid scrupulously. The bank is oval in shape and is almost certainly formed by a long barrow of the Paleolithic age. This theory is borne out by the fact that at one time the curious Randall's Round was danced around the mound, the victim being led into the fringe of the thicket that surrounds it. Whether this is still the case, I cannot be certain. Permission to open the tumulus has always been most firmly refused. Well, how funny, thought Hayling, lighting his pipe. And what a lark if, if I could get into that barrow. God, I wonder if I could get permission. I mean, the villagers seem to have changed their ways a bit. They, they do their show in the village nowadays. They, they make me so set on their, their blessed mound as they used to be. Where, where exactly is the place? He drew out the ordnance map and, and soon found it. It was a field about, about a, a mile and a half northwest of the village with the word tumulus in Gothic characters. Ah, I'll go and take a look at that tomorrow, I think, he said to himself, folding up the map. Find out who owns the field. Get leave to investigate a bit. The innkeeper, he'll, he'll probably know who the owner is, I expect. Now, unfortunately for Hayling's plans, the next day dawned wet although occasional gleams gave hope that the weather would clear up later on. His interest in the mound had not faded during the night, and he determined that as soon as the weather did improve, he'd cycle out to Randall's bank and have a proper look at it. Meanwhile, it mightn't be a bad plan to see whether the Guild Hall did hold any records that might throw a light on his search, as Mortleg had suggested. So he hunted out a worthy who was, amongst other things, the town clerk, and he was led by him to the handsome 15th century building that he noticed on his way to the Flaming Hand the day before. It was cool and dark inside, and the atmosphere and the antiquity of the place pleased Hayling. He, he liked the, the simple groining of the roof and the, the worn stone stair that led up to the record room. This was a, a low, comfortable chamber with deep windows and a, a singularly beautiful ceiling. Hayling noticed that it also contained a small reference library, and while the town clerk pottered with keys in the locks of chests and presses, he browsed the books on the shelves. Now, one title immediately caught his eye. Prehistoric Remains in the Cotswolds. He, he took the volume down. The opening chapter dealt with prehistoric remains in general, and glancing through it, he saw mentions of long and round barrows. Now, he knew precious little about barrows, and he thought it would be just as well to find out a little more before he began his exploration. So he kept the book in his hand for closer inspection. And when the town clerk left him alone in the record room, it was the first thing that he looked at. Now, the, the first chapter was, in fact, very brief and skimpy, and Hailing had soon exhausted its interest, but he did pick up some things that he'd not known before. Long barrows, he gathered, were older than round and more uncommon, and they were often objects of superstitious awe among the country folk of the district, who generally opposed any effort to explore them. The town records were, fortunately, much more amusing than the book, however, and Hailing very soon found reference to the subject that he was interested in. There had been, it seemed, a lawsuit in the early 17th century which concerned the field containing Randall's Mound, and Hailing's curiosity was redoubled by the vagueness of the testimony. A certain John Beale had, the record showed, bought charges of witchcraft against diverse persons of this town. Beale had reason for alarm because his son, a young and comely lad of 20 years, 
had completely disappeared. Wherefore, the record said, the said John Beale did openly declare and state that his son Francis had been led away by warlocks in the dance, for his ring, which he had long worn, was found in the field which he wot of, and had by them been done to death by abominable practices. Now, the case had been successfully hushed up, it seems, although several people cited by Mr. Beale did admit to having been in the company of the missing youth on the night of his disappearance, which Hayling was interested to note was that very day, the 31st of October. Another document of a slightly later date recorded the attempted sale of the field, no name was ever given to it, and the refusal of the purchaser to fulfil his contract, owing to the ill repute of the place, which was unknown to him when he did enter into his bargain. The only other documents of interest were, again, of the, the 17th century, wherein the authorities of the Commonwealth invade against the lewd games and dancing which are service to Satanus and a most strong abomination to the Lord. These spoke openly of devil worship and the, the loathly ceremony at the bank in the field. It, it seemed that more than one person had stood trial for conducting these ceremonies and against one case which was dated 7th of November 1659 was written, Conwicti et combusti. Good grief, exclaimed Hayling. Burnt? What an appalling business. I suppose that those poor beggars are only doing much the same thing as those chaps that I saw yesterday. Now he, he sat lost in thought for some time and he reflected how that odd tune and dance must have gone on in this remote village for, oh gosh, how many centuries? I and mean, had there been more to it once, he wondered. D did that queer business with the animal hide mean we had some real devilry? Pictures floated into his mind. Odd, squat little men, broad of shoulder and long of arm, naked and hairy, dancing in solemn, ghastly worship dim ages ago. <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> the business was getting a stronger hold of him than he, he would have thought possible. It strikes me that if there is anything of the, the old devilry left, it'll be in that field, he concluded at last. I mean, the dance that they do now is, is clearly all open and above board, but uh, you know, if, if they still avoid the field, as that book of Mortlake seems to think, then there might just be something in it. He rose and went down to inform the town clerk that his researches were over, and then he went back to the inn in a, a comfortable frame of mind. Certainly his weekend was bringing him distraction from his university work. <laughs> no thought of that had entered his head since he'd, he'd first heard those children singing outside the inn. That charming old world melody. Now Mr Gibbs, the landlord of the Flaming Hand, was a, a solid honest looking fellow and Hayling felt that he could depend upon him for a reasonable account of the field and the bank. So he, he tackled him after lunch and he was at once amused, surprised and faintly annoyed to find that the man hedged as soon as he was questioned on the subject. He quite definitely opposed any question of exploration. I'm not like some of them, sir, he said. I wouldn't go for to say that it'd do any harm for you to take a turn in the field when it was light like. But it ain't healthy after dark, sir, that field hand. Nor ain't it no sense to go a digging and a delving in that there bank. I, I lived in this here place a matter of 40 year, man and boy, and I know what I'm saying of. But I don't know why isn't it healthy? Is, is it marshy? No, sir, it ain't ain't not to say marshy. Well, I mean, don't the farmers ever cultivate it? Well, sir. All I can say is I've been in this place nearly 40 years, man and boy, and it ain't never been dug nor ploughed nor sown nor reaped in my memory, nor yet in my father's, nor in my grandfather's. Crops wouldn't do, sir, not in that field. Well, look, I, I'm sorry, but I, I've, I very much want to go and examine the mound. Who's the owner? I, I ought to get his leave, I suppose. You won't do that, sir. Why not? Because I'm the owner, sir. 
And I won't have no one, not the king himself, nor yet the king's son, a, a digging in that bank. Not for a wagon load of gold, I won't. Well, Hayling saw that it was quite useless. Oh, God, all right then. I mean, if you feel so strongly about it. The stubborn, half-frightened look left his host's eyes. Thank you, sir, he said gratefully. Thank you kindly. But he had not gained a victory. Hailing was as obstinate as he, and he had determined that before he left Randall's, he would have investigated that barrow. If he couldn't get permission, then he'd manage without it. He decided that as soon as darkness fell, he would go out on the quiet and explore in earnest. He'd borrow a spade from the open cart shed of the inn, a spade and a pick, if he could find one. He, he began to feel some of the enthusiasm of the explorer. He decided that he would spend part of the afternoon in examining the outside of the mound. It was not more than ten minutes' ride to the field which lay on the road. It was, as the landlord had said, quite uncultivated. Almost in the middle of it rose the mound, a clump of stunted trees and bushes, a, a thick mass of intertwined boughs that would certainly take some strength to penetrate Guy, was that? Was it really a tomb? <laughs> Hailing wondered, and he thought with awe of the the strange prehistoric being who might lie there, his, his rude jewels and arms spread about him. It, his interest was keener than ever, and he returned to the inn, determined to get into that barrow as soon as it was dark enough to try. He felt restless, in fact, now excited, and he, he fidgeted about the room, one eye constantly on his watch. You know, he, he wanted to get into that field as soon as possible after dark, because his casual inspection of the afternoon had shown him that the task of pushing aside those bushes would not be a light one. And then, of course, it was the opening of the tumulus itself. I mean, that soil, untouched by spade or plough for centuries, would have to be broken up by a pick until an entrance was forced into the chamber within. I mean, he really ought to be off as soon as he could safely secure the tools that he wanted to borrow. Fate was against him, however. There seemed, that evening, to be a constant flow of visitors to the Flaming Hand Inn. And not ordinary labourers dropping in for a drink either. No, these were private visitors to the landlord. They'd go secretively through to his parlour behind the bar and then leave by the yard at the side of the inn. <laughs> it seemed like some silly kind of mystery story, thought Hailing impatiently. That affair in the marketplace, the landlord's odd manner over the question of the field, and now this hushed coming and going from the landlord's room. He went to his bedroom and looked out into the yard to make quite sure that the pick and the spade were, were still in the open cart shed. To his relief, they were. But as he looked, he got a surprise. A man slipped out from the door of the inn kitchen and scuttled across the yard into the lane that lay behind it. Another followed him, and a little while another yet, and all three had black faces. I mean, their hands showed light and their necks, but their faces were covered in soot. This is mad, <laughs> said Hailing half aloud. Good grief, I didn't expect to run into this sort of farce when I came here. I wonder if all old Gibbs's mysterious visitors have had black faces. Anyway, I wish they'd buck up and clear out. I, I may not have another chance to go to that mound if I don't get off soon. The queer happenings at the inn appeared to him slowly as obstacles to his own movements. I mean, if their import came into his mind at all, it was to make him wonder whether there were any play, like a mummer's show, which the, the village kept up. Or games, perhaps, like those played in Scotland on Halloween. Oh, of course! Uh, that, was, that was the explanation. It was all Hallow's Eve. Well, why couldn't they buck up and get on with it, though? His patience was not to be tried much longer, however. Soon after nine o'clock, the noises and the comings and goings abruptly ceased. To make doubly sure, Hayling did not leave his room till ten had struck from Randall's church, and then he got cautiously out of his bedroom window and landed softly on the cobbles of the yard. The tools still leaned against the wall of the open shed, and, and these he got. The shed where his cycle stood locked, however, 
And he, he swore at the loss of time that this would mean in getting to the field. It would take him at least 25 minutes to walk. But in fact, it didn't take quite so long. His, his impatience gave him speed. The country looked very beautiful under the slow rising hunter's moon. The, the long bare lines of the fields swept up to the ridges, black against the dark serene blue of the night sky. The air was cool and clean with the smell of frost in it, but hailing, hurrying along the rough white road, was only dimly conscious of the purity and peace of the night. At last, the field came in sight, empty and still in the cold moonlight. Only the mound, black as a tomb, broke the flood of light. The gate was wide open, and even in his haste this struck hailing as odd. He decided to attack the barrow on the side away from the road, lest any belated labourer should pass by and see him. So he walked round the mound, looking for a thin spot in its defence of thorn and hazel bushes, but nothing presented itself. The scrub formed a, a thick belt all round, and it was so high that he, he couldn't see the top of the mound at all. The confounded stuff might grow halfway up the tumulus for all that he could see. And so he abandoned any idea of finding an easy spot to begin operations. It was obviously simply a question of breaking through. And then, just as he was about to take this heroic course, he stopped short, listening. It sounded to him uh, as if some creature were moving within the bushes, something heavy and bulky, breaking the smaller branches of the undergrowth. A fox, I suppose, he thought. Must be a monster, though. Sounds more like a cow. Oh, well, here goes. He turned his back to the belt of thick undergrowth, ducked his head forward, and was just about to force his backwards way through the bushes when again he stopped to listen. And this time it was a very different sound that arrested him. It was the distant playing of a pipe. He recognised it at once. It was the plaintive melody of Randall's Round. He paused, still listening. And now, feet were coming up the road. Many feet, pattering unevenly. <laughs> there was some village game afoot then. The words of Mortlake's book came back to his mind. The author had said that at one time the barrow was the centre of the old dance, Randall's Round. Was it possible that it still was, that there was a, a second form, less decorous perhaps, which took place at night. Anyhow, he, he mustn't be seen, he was certain of that. Now, luckily, the, the mound was between him and the road, so he stole cautiously towards the hedge on the far side of the field. Thank goodness it was a hedge and not one of those low stone walls that surround most fields in the Cotswolds. As he took cover, he couldn't help feeling a little bit stupid. I mean, was it really necessary to take this precaution? But then he remembered the look of stubborn determination on his landlord's face. Yes. No, I mean, if he were to investigate the barrow properly, then he must keep dark. Besides, there, there might be something to see in this business, something to delight old Mortlake's heart. The tune came nearer, and the sounds of footsteps was muffled. Though they were in the grass now, clearly. Hailing cautiously, raised his head from the ditch where he lay, but the mound blocked his view. <laughs> what luck that he'd happened to go to Randall's just at that time of year. He remembered the, the documents in the Guild Hall and John Beale's indictment of the man who, he averred, had made away with his son at Halloween. Hailing's blood tingled with excitement. The playing came closer, and now he could see the figures of men moving into the circle they formed for Randall's Round. Again, he was, he was struck by the queer, barbaric look of the thing and, and by the gravity of their movements. And then his heart gave a sudden heavy thump. The dancers had all the blackened, mask-like faces of the men that he'd seen leaving the inn. How very odd, thought Hailing. They perform quite openly in the village square and then they, they steal away at night disguising their faces. And the dance was extraordinarily impressive, seen in that empty field under the quiet moon. There was no sound but the, 
the whispering of feet on the long dry grass and the, the melancholy music of the pipe. And then, quite suddenly, Hailing heard again the cracking rustling sound from the dense bushes about the mound. It was exactly like the stirring of some big clumsy animal. The dancers heard it too. There came a sort of shuddering gasp from them. Hailing saw one man glance at his neighbour and his eyes shone light and terrified in his blackened face. The melody came slower now and with a kind of horror, Hailing knew that the crisis of the dance was near. Slowly the dancers formed the ring. Their faces turned away from the mound and then... From outside the circle came a shrouded figure led by a man wearing a mask like a bull's head. The veiled form was led into the ring. The pipe mourned on. And then again, shattering the quiet, came a snapping, crashing noise from the innermost recesses of the bushes about the barrow. There was no doubt some big animal was in there crashing its way out. And then Hailing saw it. Bulky and black in the pure white light. Some primitive creature with heavy lowered head. The suggestion of horns. The dancers circled slowly. The air of the flute grew faint. Hailing felt cold and sick. This was loathsome. This was devilish. He buried his head in his arms and tried to drown the sound of that mourning melody. But sounds came through the muffling hounds of his ears nonetheless. Crunching, tearing sounds. A dreadful sound like, like an animal lapping. Sweat broke out on Hailing's back. Oh, no, no. It, it sounded like bones. It sounded like bones snapping. He could not think or move or pray. The haunting music crooned on. The crashing, snapping noise sounded again as the branches broke. Whatever it was, was going back into its lair. The tune grew fainter and fainter. Steps sounded again on the road, slow steps with no life in them. The rite was over. Very cautiously, Hailing got to his feet. His knees trembled and his breath came short and rough. He felt sick with horror and with personal fear as he skirted the mound. His fascinated eyes saw the break in the hazels and thorns. And then they fell upon a dark mark on the ground. Dark and wet. Soaking into the grass. A white rag. Dappled with dark stains lay near. Halen could bear no more. He gave a strangled cry. As he rushed, blindly stumbling, falling sometimes out of the field and down the road. <laughs>